If you'd open up your Bibles this morning to uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 4 through 7, I'd like to continue our second in the series on spiritual gifts. One God and diverse gifts. I'd like to read verses 4 through 7. There are diversities of gifts, but the same Spirit. And there are differences of ministries, but the same Lord. And there are diversities of activities, but the same God who works all in all. But the manifestation of the Spirit is given to each one for the profit of all. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, how we praise you this morning for this portion of Scripture here that speaks so clearly about the oneness, the the unity in spiritual gifts because they come from a triune God and the diversity of the gifts as they are spread out amongst the body of Christ. And as we look at this passage here today, Lord, we'd ask that you'd give us clearness of mind, help us to focus in fresh and anew on spiritual gifts. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. Well, as we will see in this study in 1 Corinthians chapters 12 through 14, there really is, as I've already mentioned, a great deal of confusion, a fair amount of ignorance, an awful lot of poor hermeneutics, and in a number of cases, just outright heresy. And the church is rife for this, and uh, when these, especially within the Pentecostal and Charismatic movement, if they carry these things, their, ver their views to the logical end, it does end in extreme heresy. And what Paul wants us to realize as we start off in talking about spiritual gifts is that the church at Corinth lacked none of the gifts of verses 4 through 7 of 1 Corinthians 1. I thank my God always concerning you for the grace of God which was given to you by Christ Jesus that you were enriched in everything by him in all utterance and all knowledge even as the testimony of Christ was confirmed in you so that you came, you come short in no gift, eagerly waiting for the revelation of our Lord Jesus Christ. So even in this church, with all of its carnality, the spiritual gifts were operative. And he says here they were all in operation. And so we need to, when we start to study this particular portion of Scripture, we need to realize that this is not talking about gifts that are given to a selected few, but rather are given to everybody, as we will see in the body of Christ. The problem then, as now and then, was abuse and ignorance of the use of spiritual gifts. And that's what Paul is dealing with here in chapters 12, 13, and 14. And, and I might just add this. Um, I was thinking about this uh, early this morning. We get to chapter 13, and one of the things we do is we pull chapter 13 out, and we, and we deal with it as it's something, a, a whole different subject, because it talks about love. 1 Corinthians 13 is in between 12 and 14. And the context is all about spiritual gifts, and that they are to be used in the modus operandi or in the environment of love. That is the controller of spiritual gifts within the body of Christ. And this is not a love that you and I can conjure up, but rather a love that is borne out by the Spirit of God. And that's what 1 Corinthians really is dealing with. So when we look at all of 1 Corinthians 12, 13, and 14, and we are talking about corrective instruction regarding gifts, remember all four chapters, or all three chapters must go together. You can't take chapter 14 where Paul seems to zero in on the gift of ecstatic tongues and separate that from 12 or 13. So that's important. Here in our passage, um, Paul sets before us uh, and answers, I think, three questions. What are the origins of gifts? What are 
the diversity of gifts, and is there diversity of gifts? And thirdly, what are the purposes of gifts? Now, the last one is answered here in this passage and then will be answered again in chapter 14 in greater detail. So we'll start off here with the origin of gifts. Look at verses 4 through 6. There are diversities of gifts, but the same spirit. There are differences of ministries, but the same Lord. And there are diversities of activities, but the same God who works all in all. Now, when you get a chance, you ought to sit down and read these three verses here from a number of different translations. And I would recommend uh, not just the New King James or the King James, but also the New American Standard and English Standard Version. Because you will notice as we go through this, there will be some word variation that will help you to understand what the Apostle Paul is saying here. But here in this passage, quite clearly, the Apostle Paul, not only as we're going to see is he speaking about diversity of gifts, but he's also speaking about the unity of gifts in its origin. As with every activity of God, the full Trinitarian God is involved. Now, I want you to just see this real quick, like, so that you see this. There are diversity of gifts, but the same spirit. There are differences of ministry, but the same Lord, speaking of Christ. And there are diversities of activities, but the same God, speaking of the Father, who works all in all. And so we see, and so this is not unusual. When God moves, he moves as a triune God. For instance, we see this in creation in Genesis chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was on the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. Now, the translators knew that this was talking in a Trinitarian sense, and so the word spirit was capitalized. If you, if, and if that didn't make much sense, we just go to verse 26. Then God said, let, let us, speaking of God in the plural, Elohim, let us make man in our image according to our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and the birds of the air, and over the cattle and over all the earth and every creeping thing. So now we see the full triune God mentioned here with the plural. And then in John chapter 1, verses 1 through 3, we see that Jesus Christ is the creator. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him, was nothing, uh, without him nothing was made that was made. And this is reiterated again in Colossians chapter 1, verse 16. For by him all things were created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created through him and for him, speaking of the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. We also see the triune God, and often what we do when we think of salvation, we zero in on the second person of the Trinity, the Lord Jesus Christ. But in actuality, the full triune God is involved even in redemption. Now, what, I'm just going to share a few, very few verses here. And the reason for it is, is if I shared all of them, we'd be here all afternoon. Because there are a great many of passages of scripture dealing with the doctrine of soteriology or salvation that speak to the triune God, the different persons of the Godhead. Romans chapter 1, for instance, well, let me go up to the, um, the first one, the Father uh, in salvation. John 3.16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life, speaking of God is, as the Father. First John chapter 4, verse 10, In this is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his Son. Did you get that? He loved us. Who's he? That's the Father, sent his Son, 
to be a propitiation for our sins. And there are plenty of other passages of Scripture. We could go to the Gospels as well and see that it was God the Father that sent Jesus. He argued that over and over with the Pharisees. And of course, uh, the obvious one is that Jesus Christ is involved in salvation. Romans chapter 3, verses 24 and 25. Being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God set forth as a propitiation by his blood through faith to demonstrate his righteousness because in his forbearance God had passed over the sins that were previously committed. You'll notice in these in this passage, verses 24 and 25, not only is Jesus Christ mentioned here, but so is God, the Father. And so both are mentioned, but that one I think is an important one. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 22 for as in Adam all die, even so in Christ all shall be made alive. And of course, we could go back to the gospel accounts there where Jesus uh, says to uh, Martha, I am the resurrection and the life. And then, of course, I think a passage that speaks most clearly to the work of Christ um, not the most clearly. It's one of them. There's just so many. Philippians chapter 2, verses 7 and 8. But made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant, and coming in the likeness of men, and being found in the appearance of a man, he humbled himself and became obedient uh, to the point of death, even the death of the cross, speaking of the Lord Jesus Christ. And then thirdly, the Holy Spirit was, is involved in salvation. John chapter 3, verse 5, and I could have gone down a little bit further and uh, picked up uh, uh, verse 6 as well, but uh, I think this one is good enough. Jesus said, Most assuredly I say to you, unless one is born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. Now, folks, just as a point of clarity here, born of the water is not baptism. And water in the Old Testament as well as in the New Testament was a picture of the word of God. So he's saying there that you're born of the word and of the, wa and of the spirit. And then Titus chapter 3 verse 5. Not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy he saved us through the washing. There, there we go again. It goes back to this idea of water. Of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit. So we are regenerated by the Spirit of God. And then we could also go back to John chapter 3 again, where it talks about the wind blows wherever it may, and no one knows when, where, how the Spirit will move, again speaking of the Spirit of God. And now, in spiritual gifts, uh, this becomes really clear, as I just mentioned. Let me just read the passage again. And now you will see it even more clearly. There are diversities of gifts, but the same spirit. There are differences of ministries, but the same Lord. And there are diversities of activities, but it is the same God who works all in all. So what is he talking about here? First off, it is the spirit who gives the gifts. There are diversities of gifts, but the same spirit. Now the word gifts here is the word charismata. And I think this is an important word for us to understand because we're going to run into it a lot more as we go through th this section of scripture. And it is found here in our text in the plural. But essentially it means gifts of uh, gift of grace or grace gifts or grace enablements. In other words, grace is really important. Charis, that's the root word here get for grace. What we're saying here is these gifts are given to us as an operation of the grace of God. Now what do we know about grace? Grace is the opposite of works. That's what we know. So therefore, as we're going to see a little bit later on when we get down in the next section in verse 30 and 31, 
where he talks about seeking the better gifts. We're going to find out that the passage there really is talking about, but you seek the better, get better gifts. It's found as a declarative statement, but I will show you a better way. We got people out there, and I will deal with this in greater length, but seeking gifts, how do you seek something that God gives us by grace? Explain that to me. So the word charismata is not used here by accident. Grace abilities. And in uh, 16 of the 17 New Testament uses of, of this word, God is seen as the giver. He gives them to you. Secondly, Jesus places or assigns us the place of ministry. Uh, again, verse 5, there are diversities of ministries, but the same Lord. So the Spirit gives the gift, and then the Spirit, then Jesus assigns the place of ministry. Now, we will talk about this again at further length, but just as a, a primer to all of this, you may end up with the gift of uh, exhortation, or let's um, let me use another word: the gift of edification. And you think, well, if I got the gift of edification, then that must mean I've got to be a Sunday school teacher. Maybe, maybe not. God can use the gift of edification in a number of different ways, as well as the gift of exhortation, or the gift of prophecy, or any of the other gifts. It is Jesus Christ who assigns the place of ministry. And we'll talk about how we find that place and where Christ wants us later. But understand that Jesus then places or assigns the ministry. There are differences of ministries, but the same Lord. And then thirdly, it is the Father who empowers. Verse 6 and there are diversities of activities, but the same God who works all in all. The word activities uh, can mean, uh, it's the word uh, 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 energema. Uh, the New American Standard translates this effects. But what it literally means is what is worked out or energize. In other words, it is God then who energizes us, supplies the energy, supplies the power in order to carry out the spiritual gift and the place of ministry. So now you begin to see how the whole triune God is involved in this. And God the Father then is the one who provides the spiritual gifts, also provides the energy and power as well as the faith in order to operate that gift. So what am I trying to say here? Simply this. The topic of spiritual gifts is not, is not Holy Spirit centered. Uh, when you get around uh, many within evangelical uh, circles and they talk about spiritual gifts, you will notice that the discussion is all about the Holy Spirit. When it is Holy Spirit-centered, here's what you ought to know. They're already off base. They already don't have a clear understanding of what's going on here. The full Trinitarian God is involved. The Spirit gives the gifts. Christ assigns a place to ministry. God the Father empowers those gifts. And if we were going to be centered on any individual within the Trinity then the scripture ought to tell us who that is. And thankfully it does. And it's found in Colossians chapter 1 and verse 18. And he is the head, speaking of Christ, of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have the preeminence. So even in spiritual gifts, 
It shouldn't be the Holy Spirit that we should center on. It should be the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. It ought to be Christocentric, not Holy Spirit-centered. So secondly, we have the diversities of gifts in ministries, again, in verses 4 through 6. Let's just read that passage one more time. So now we found out who the authors of these things are, who, how the Trinitarian God is involved in giftedness. But let's talk about the diversity of gifts. There are diversities of gifts. Oh, well, there we go. But the same spirit. There are differences of ministries, but the same Lord. And there are diversities of activities or effects, but it is the same God who works all in all. So, the point here is that the Spirit gives each of us in the body of Christ gifts of grace or grace abilities, charismata. He is the one who does that. And as we're going to see a little bit later, that this is a sovereign work of God that takes place at the moment of conversion. Gifts are given then. Now, they may not be realized and used until later or under certain circumstances, but nevertheless, it is God who sovereignly gives the gifts. Now, I want to just ask this question. Well, I'll answer it, of course, later in much greater detail. If God sovereignly gives us the gifts of conversions, why are we praying for God to give us gifts when he's already given them? And speaking of that, you out there, all of us, have at least one gift. 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 10 says, Each one has received a gift. Minister to one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. Uh, I remember when I was in Bible college, uh, it, we had just started a... Uh, a, a new quarter, and I was in a new class, and I'm sitting there in the class, and it was in the middle of the winter. And I went to the class, and I was not feeling very good. I had a really bad cold. I don't, I don't know how you are when you get a cold, but I get cranky. And um, I'm sitting in this class, and I'm going, I don't want to talk to anybody. I'm barely here and functioning. Now, when I was in Bible college, this was in 1973, 74, 75, in there. And the whole discussion of spiritual gifts was a big deal. Not only was the discussion about uh, the second coming of Christ a big thing, but spiritual giftedness was a big deal as well. And so there were all kinds of spiritual gift conferences going on, much of them uh, trying to respond to the errors of the charismatic movement. So I'm sitting in this classroom, and this gal walks in that I knew, and she comes down and sits right next to me. And um, she turns to me and says, Hi, Mike, how are, you? how are you? I said, Fine. Next words out of her mouth is, What's your spiritual gift? I <laughs> go, <sighs> uh. And that's about how I felt. I went, what's my spiritual gift? It's kind of like, you know, you go into a coffee shop and you sit down and someone walks up to you that you know, maybe probably a non-Christian that would do this. They walk up to you and say, hi, how are you? Fine. Uh, what's your uh, zodiac sign? Uh, that's about how I felt about this whole thing. What's my spiritual gift? What does that have to do with the price of tea in China? You know, that I, where I was at. And so I thought for a second, and I turned to her, and I says, well, I said, uh, I don't know for sure, but I think that I have the gift of evangelism and the gift of prophecy. She turned to me and said, you're wrong. And I'm going, she doesn't even know me. How does she know I'm wrong? And well, she was basing it here on 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 10. Her pastor had taught her that you only get one gift. That's not what the passage is saying. It is saying that you at least get one gift. 
But in our passage here, it is obvious that there could be multiple gifts. Verse 6, having then gifts differing according to the grace that God has given us. You at least have one, you probably have multiple gifts. Not multiple personalities, that's a different story. I'm talking about multiple gifts. Now we'll talk about that and I will later on we will look at the gifts and I will give you definitions of the gifts. Uh, let me, spoiler alert here, uh, I have about 10 books in my library on the gifts of the Spirit. All written by conservative guys. And they all differ on the definition of the gifts. So the definitions that I will be giving you later on will be a compilation of what I think are the best definitions that I found in all of those books. And as I search the scripture and try to uh, figure out how the scripture uses the particular terms. But let me just make this real clear. It is not that important that you know the name of the gift. What is important is that you live a holy life so the gifts of God that he sovereignly gave to you will be operative in your life. Now you say, well, if that's the case, do we need to do the rest of this study? The answer is yes. Simply because there is a great deal of misinformation out there and secondly, for edification purposes, it would be nice to know the definition of gifts, wouldn't it? And how they're used. Isn't it good to know that the gifts aren't Holy Spirit centered, but rather they are in operation of the full triune God? Sure. So we are given diversities of gifts. And in many cases, multiple gifts, as I just read in verse 6. Lastly, the purpose of gifts. Now this won't be the first time that we're going to find see this. We will see this again in 1 Corinthians chapter 14. <clears throat> the purpose of gifts is found in verse 7. But the manifestation of the Spirit, in other words, the gifts that Christ, the gifts that, that the Spirit gave you, how they will be manifested, is given to each one for the profit of all. Not for yours, to, for you to consume on yourself, but for the profit of the body of Christ. And that's important. And by the way, if you use that definition and apply it to what the charismatics call a prayer tongue, we got a real problem. Because it's not profiting all. Frankly, if you are speaking in tongues in the church and there's no interpreter, as we will find out in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, then we have a problem. The body of Christ is not profited by it. Okay? So, now, just hang in there. You're saying, oh, so is Pastor Mike saying that it's okay to speak in tongues in the church? So I'm not saying that. What I am saying is, is that is part of a test that is used by the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 14. And we will look at a myriad of things in 1 Corinthians 14 that have to occur in order for tongues to be operative in the church. And the bottom line is, spoiler alert again, the gift of tongues as we know it from the book of Acts in chapter 2 no longer is operative in the church. And we'll see that a little later. So the purpose of gifts is found then in verse 7, but the manifestation of the Spirit is given to each one for the profit of all. In other words, they are given for the common good. That's how the New American Standard and the English Standard Version translates it. For the common good, the profit of all. Somperion is the Greek word. And in its verb form, it means to bring together. It unifies us and edifies us. They are not to be consumed upon ourselves, but on others. There is a companion passage to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. It's called Romans chapter 12. And in Romans chapter 12, we read this. For I say... Through the grace given to me, to everyone that is among you, 
not to think of himself more highly than, uh, than he ought to think, but to think soberly as God has dealt with each one a measure of faith. Now, right there, that's a hint. He said, don't get all puffed up because you have a gift that somebody else doesn't have. That's what measure of faith is talking about. Now, if you don't believe that, you'll see it in the next few verses. Because he makes it super clear. But that was happening in the Corinthian church. Obviously, it was happening in the church at Rome. So, you know, you wanted to be the nose out front. Only to find out, as we're going to find in 1 Corinthians 14, it is the weaker gifts that receive the greater praise and glory. So he goes on and says, For as we have many members in one body, diversity of members, but all members do not have the same function or the same gift. So we, being many, as one body in Christ, and individual members, one of another, having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given us. Did you get that? We have gifts that differ from one another according to the grace. Grace is a sovereign work of God. No need to pray for spiritual gifts. You already have them. You might want to pray that you would be obedient in using your gifts, but God has already given you grace abilities. Having gifts differing according to the grace that is given us, let us, let us use them, if prophecy, let us use prophecy in portion to our faith in, or ministry, let us use it in ministering, he who teaches in teaching, he who exhorts in his exhortation, and he who gives with liberality, he who leads with diligence, and he who shows mercy with cheerfulness. Now I'm reading through this passage and I notice the word gives. There is a spiritual gift called giving. The gift of giving. You know what I think is interesting? I have not found a spiritual movement on the spiritual gift of giving. I think we ought to have one, maybe. You know. I just thought that was interesting. Instead, it's all these, what we call, I call showy gifts, or sign gifts, as we'll see later on. The ones that draw attention to who? Us. And what are the gifts for? The edification of the body. And you may be using a particular gift, and it may be, in some cases, a showy gift, and in other cases, and in most cases, not. So he's, and in 1 Corinthians 12, he's saying, you need to use your gifts based upon the grace ability that God gave you. Wow. Romans chapter 15, verse 2 says, let each of us please his neighbor for his good, leading to edification. And then, of course, when we get to 1 Corinthians again, in 1 Corinthians 14, verse 3, it says, But he who prophesies speaks edification and exhortation and comfort to men. Now, the word here for edification, or for prophecy, we'll get into the definitions in greater length, but it has two aspects to it. Foretelling and forthtelling. The foretelling has passed away with the maturity of the church and the completion of the scripture. We'll see that in 1 Corinthians chapter 13. But the fourth telling continues today, and we call that the preaching of the word or the expounding of the word of God. And what does he say here about that? Well, it brings, speaks to edification and exhortation and comfort. Verse 5 of 1 Corinthians chapter 14 says, I wish you all spoke with tongues, but even more that you prophesy, for he who prophesies is greater than he who speaks in tongues. Uh, again, why don't we have a movement on the gift of biblical prophecy, New Testament prophecy? Prophecy. 
on forth telling instead of a gift on one on a lesser gift called tongues. It says unless indeed he interprets the church that the church may be uh, receive edification. And then again down in verse 12 of 1 Corinthians 14 it says even so since you are zealous for spiritual gifts let it be for the edification of the church that you seek to excel. Not for your edification. Excel in edifying the body of Christ. Whatever gift you have even the gift of giving can be for the edification of the body. Why? Because it allows, the body, it allows the church then to do certain things in order that you would be edified. All of the gifts revolve, finally end up. They zero in. Every single solitary one of them end up on edification. They all do. I have one concluding statement. God gives the church gifts for the edification and the grounding of the church. Ephesians chapter 4, verses 11 through 15. Now, before I read it, I want you to understand something. When we get into the list of gifts, I will again mention this. There, are, there is no singular list of gifts. And the lists that we have, and they're found in four different portions of Scripture, are uh, lists of gifts that are used as examples. They are not restrictive. So, when we read Ephesians chapter 4, verses 11 through 15, you understand that. Here we are. And he himself gave some to be apostles, some to be prophets, some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers. Now, he's just using those gifts because they're the obvious ones regarding edification. Because that's what he was talking about prior to that, and that's what he's going to end with. Why, he says? For the, edifi for the equipping of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come to the unity of faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to the perfect man, to the measure and stature of the fullness of Christ, that we should no longer be children tossed to and fro and carried away by every wind of doctrine, by the trickery of men and the cunning craftiness and deceit deceitful plotting. But speaking the truth and love may grow up in all things in him who is the head, Christ. God gives gifts. I don't care what gift it is. In order that the body of Christ would be built up and edified. So that we're not tossed to and fro by every wind of doctrine. The problem is in the church, and why we have such weak churches, is that spiritual giftedness in the body as a whole is lacking. Not that we don't have the gifts. We're just not using them. And if we were, as a body, we would find that we would grow up in maturity into the full stature and measure and fullness of Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you this morning for this time that we've had. And ask God that you would bless our fellowship here this morning, especially as we go to the Lord's table. Ask that you would bless it as well. We pray in Christ's name. Amen.